Um, great, so today I'm going to be uh, not talking about action that much, but more talking about perception. Um, and in particular, I want to tell you guys that if you want to really do complicated actions, you need to understand the 3D world that you live in, as well as perceive what the different objects are doing in three-dimensional space. And then I'm going to just give you a couple of thoughts about the use of simulation uh, in this context. Okay, and I'm mostly going to be talking in the context of self-driving cars, but you know you can generalize this to your favorite robot. Um, so, in terms of uh, sensing the world, right? So, if you are to spend a lot of money in sensing, then basically this is already trivial, right? One can use a Velodyne that basically gives you three-dimensional representation of what's happening out there, right? And that should be able to uh, help you do better actions. Now, if you are interested in building systems that are affordable, that can actually work with sensors that cost only you know, $40 instead of $80,000 that a Velodyne costs these days, um, then you need to do much more work. Um, so in particular, uh, for self-driving cars, right, it's very interesting to look at, can I use a single camera, can I use two cameras? And because it's more affordable, but also because most of the new cars have already cameras embedded in them, so you know, we can already play with them. Um, so in the case of uh, using two cameras, then the basic idea is that you want to solve uh, uh, the three reconstruction problem, which is a stereo estimation. Now you can go one step further and then say that, well, maybe I can just use a single camera and then what I need to do is solve the structure from motion problem. Uh, and I need to do this by also handling moving objects that basically break most of the algorithms out there uh, in computer vision. Now, so I'm going to show you just uh, a couple of uh, thoughts on how to estimate the stereo efficiently uh, in a way that actually uh, is able to represent the world well in three-dimensional space, uh, at least good enough such that you can do uh, control. Um, so the idea of a stereo is that you have two cameras, assume for example they're mounted on your robot or mounted on your car, and if you want to do things like driving, what you need to be is you need to be very robust, right? You need to be good enough, right? You need, need to be, you know, um, uh, pixel accurate, that's a pixel accurate, but you need to make sure that your 3D estimates are reasonable enough so that you can actually, again, uh, do a reasonable action. Um, you need to be fast, right, because this uh, has to run in real time in the car, and I argue that you also need to pay attention to this so that things are trainable with a small number of examples, right, say 100 images. Um, so probably the thing that comes to mind to everybody is, well, if I have uh, um, if I have uh, images, what I can use is basically my favorite convolutional net uh, with an encoder-decoder architecture where basically I have a stereo per as input and then I learn a regression function that basically tells me for every pixel uh, what is the depth. Um, so this is good at inference time because, you know, with a lot of the model compression techniques, etc., you can make this run, you know, real time easily. Now, the problem of this is that now it requires a lot of uh, training data in order to generalize well. And this training data is going to be dependent on what is the distance between the cameras, the type of cameras, as well as you know, the environment, how it looks like. So an alternative, which I like much more, is to try to inject your prior knowledge about the problem in the architecture itself. Okay, so I borrowed this image from one of Jan Lenkun's papers from CBPR15, uh, which uh, I guess he was the first one to propose these matching networks, where the good thing is that they are geometrically aware, meaning that uh, the stereo problem is such that for every pixel in the left image, we want to understand where is the right, um, where is the correct pix pixel in the right image, and then given the distance between them, you can estimate depth. Okay. Um, so, uh, so the architecture is a CMS network, right? Makes sense when you want to match two things. Uh, the idea is that you're going to learn a feature representation for uh, every one of the so left image and right image, and then basically you learn a similarity matrix. Okay. Um, so there is uh, two problems with the uh, architecture that uh, was proposed here. The first one is uh, that, in a sense, it's an overkill, right? So you are first learning a representation and then learning a similarity function, right? And as a consequence, here is uh, order n squared uh, for this particular algorithm. Um, so it's actually quite slow. Um, so you can run it on a Titan X. Typically, it takes uh, one minute of computation. Uh, to run this. Now, the other thing that um, 
uh, is uh, suboptimal perhaps in the way that they design this is that is this task is treated as a classification task, either it matches or not. Um, however, when we uh, want to use this uh, for a real application, what we are very interested in is a notion of uncertainty. We would like to understand um, how we likely to have a probability distribution over all possible depths. Okay, so you can actually change these two things uh, uh, with, uh, you know, there's a very easy fix where the idea is that you can chop off this part of the network and say that you want to learn representations where simply a cosine similarity is already measuring, uh, you know, how likely it is for these two patches to be together. Uh, you can train this with a multi-class loss, you can train them co this convolutional, and as a consequence the, squ the scores will be calibrated and then you will get uh, better matching. Okay. Um, so in practice, this actually performs uh, much better in terms of raw matching. Uh, so you see here some error metric as a function of uh, uh, different uh, allowed distances in terms of the errors. And the other thing that is interesting is actually that you can get orders of magnitude speed up. So here, two orders of magnitude speed up. So you can run out of the box uh, without doing again any compression or reduced precision or anything like that, uh, simply in a Titan X. Um, and you know you can get like really nice estimates of, uh, of where the depth is. So here you can see some examples in uh, urban scenarios captured with a car driving around, and up to 40 meters you can basically replace the velodyne. Okay, so you have a much more uh, cheap solution to, uh, in this case, sensing the 3D environment. And it's okay, you know, the, uh, handling things like uh, you know thin structures, which is actually quite difficult for cameras. Um, so you can go one step further and try to say, well, can I actually do something similar, uh, but only using a single camera, okay? And so it turns out that uh, for robotics application, there is a lot of, again, prior knowledge that you can use in order to solve this task. And the idea is that if you think of a robot uh, or, or a car driving, right, most of the scene is static, and most of the motion that you see is actually due to your own motion, okay? Um, so as a consequence, motion is actually related to depth. Okay, so the idea right, is that the scene is composed of a whole bunch of moving objects as well as static part, right? And if you were able to identify where all these different moving objects are, as well as which part is static, then you can basically treat uh, the estimation problem for every one of these parts as a stereo system, where the uh, system of people aligns is different for one of the for each one of the moving objects. Okay, so you can do instance level segmentation. You can use your favorite comnet to do this. And you can estimate now do matching in one dimensional space for the different objects, including the background. You can piece together everything, and you have a representation of the scene. Okay? And that, this turns out to actually work really, really well. Uh, again, you can use the same kind of matching network to, uh, to do this, uh, where now you have two consecutive frames in time. Uh, so what is interesting about the network also, and what I show here in this, in this row, hopefully you see my mouse, is that uh, it has a good estimate of uncertainty. Uh, so here you see the most confident matches, uh, and when the, the network says that it's confident, actually more than 99% of the time is actually correct. And when the network says that it's inconfident, 50% of the time is wrong. Right? So it's really, um, you know, thanks to uh, training to actually have a distri probability distribution over disparities, it's able to understand when it's able to do the job or not. And this, you know, works really well, so it's leading the benchmark, uh, doesn't matter. Um, so this, you know, allows you to actually perceive the world in three-dimensional space using one or two cameras. Okay. The next thing that you need to do is try to understand the semantics of what's happening in the scene. So perhaps the uh, canonical thing that you have to start doing is actually object detection, right? You need to place a bounding box around the objects that are moving in the scene. Now, the field of computer vision is mostly obsessed with doing this in two-dimensional space, right? placing these two bounding boxes. However, again, for robotics applications, it's very, very important to be able to reason about this in three-dimensional space, because you need to understand where are the objects, as well as, you know, are they coming towards you or not? Are they going to be a danger? When are they going to be a danger to you? Um, so we basically develop algorithms that are able to directly reason in three-dimensional space in order to do uh, 3D object detection. And the pipeline is relatively similar to the 2D detection, but the idea is that even the object proposals are going to be in three-dimensional space. Now, this allows us to actually do more, much more robust estimation because we know a lot about objects in 3D. We know that cars cannot be flying around. We know that, uh, so they're typically moving uh, on the road, right? We know that uh, cars or pedestrians have particular sizes. 
And we can leverage this in order to re reduce the amount of computation and uncertainty that we need to do uh, in order to do detection. So here you see uh, the top set of proposals that our method comes up with. And uh, then you can use your favorite uh, CNN in order to score this thing. So, so yes, to summarize, so you have uh, your scene, you can place the red plane, you can slide around all possible uh, locations, you can score very efficiently based on, say, 2D features or 3D features, um, then uh, get the most, uh, uh, the best candidate locations, and then score with your, you know, uh, CNN uh, expensive to compute uh, module. Okay. Uh, so this actually uh, was leading the benchmark when we submitted. Uh, right now, there is a lot of uh, uh, a lot of new approaches coming up, which are you know on par or perhaps a little bit better. Okay, so if you use two cameras, this is the kind of uh, estimations that you get, and there is no temporal information used here. Okay, this is no tracking. This is every single frame is processed independently. So one other thing to notice is that the 2D is really good, right? And the 3D is pretty decent, right? Even though, again, it's using a single, uh, single camera. Sorry, it's using a single frame. Um, you can use the same sort of trick. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> You can use the same sort of trick to also do monocular versions of this, uh, where here you cannot score directly in 3D, although you can propose things in 3D and just project back to the image, and then use your favorite set of classical uh, um, uh, semantic segmentation, instant segmentation, shape features, etc., uh, all CNN based in order to score uh, the proposals. Okay. And again, this works really well, and I'm going to show you yes, the results. Uh, uh, this is with a single camera and single frame. Okay, so it works again remarkably well, even though this is a very ambiguous problem. Okay, so now if you use temporal information, right, you can have really nice and accurate uh, 3D tracking. And I'm going to show you that in a cycle. So we can piece together all these different uh, uh, things uh, in order to create a more holistic understanding of the scene. Okay, so here we're going to have a single camera mounted on the car that is going to look at the. Um, it's going to be driving towards an intersection. We focus on intersections because it's the most difficult thing uh, while driving, right? And what we are able to estimate is the geometry of the intersection, the location in the car with respect to the intersection, the traffic pattern that you see on the bottom here. Um, as well as the 3D uh, estimation of all the cars in the scene. Uh, also, in the cars are color coded by their intention. Okay? And this is all done without maps, without prior knowledge about this intersection. The car has never driven here before. Uh, so you can imagine now that once you have something like this, you can really do, do really nice control and action planning. Right? Um, you know, doing this directly from raw pixels is actually quite difficult without reasoning, you know, about what's happening in the 3D scene. Um, so probably, you know, a lot of you have seen this end-to-end -end training uh, just by, you know, raw pixels in and then you directly output, you know, whether you turn left, you turn right, etc. And you're probably wondering, do I really need something? Do I really need perception? Isn't this an overkill? Isn't this, you know, trying to solve a very difficult task in the first place? So I will argue that there is you know, a few reasons why you still want to do sensing, you still want to do perception. First of all, you can think of this as a compositional model, right? So the number of examples that you need to see in order to do end-to-end -end, you know, is exponentially larger than if you're trying to compose the scene out of the moving uh, parts. Um, so it's very important, right, in order to be able to react in the presence of the unknown. Right, so maybe you haven't seen that class category before, but you still have some 3D shape, you know, that tells you, you know, how far away this object is. Okay, so this will allow you to actually react to things where, you know, you haven't seen that kind of scenario ever before. Uh, explainability, right, is very hot these days. Liability is very, uh, very, very hot in autonomous driving, right? And if we were able to take actions based on perception, then we can really explain why our reinforcement learning algorithm took the particular action, right, based on what we see in the 3D scene. Uh, it's also important in the interactive setting, right? It's not about it's going to be self-driving cars and that's it. It's that you would like to interact with your self-driving car and, you know, tell him, oh, why don't you, t you know, follow the red car? Uh, or you can ask, you know, any sort of question about what's happening in the scene, the restaurant that you see on the right, etc. So perception is still going to have, it's still going to play a fundamental role, I think, uh, uh, even in action scenarios. 
Um, so the last thing I want to talk about in the, I guess, the last five minutes that I have, maybe. Uh, how long do I have? Five minutes? Okay, great. It's about simulation, okay? And while simulation uh, is uh, very interesting from many different perspectives, right? First of all, um, you, um, simulation is a way to get a lot of training data for perception, for action, for sensing, right? So that's interesting. Also, what is probably most interesting is that you have a no-cost, risk-free platform for testing you know, your algorithms in robots. Right, we have heard that you know safety is a big issue, right? And the number of robots that you can break, right, uh, is not allowed if you are an academic like me. Okay, but happy you are the mind, right? You can you can play with many robots or open AI. Um, so typically, when we see simulation, it's mostly based on games or simpler environments or physical-based things, right? But as we want to go into more and more realistic things, right, I argue that we need to understand how, how the world looks like in order to create simulations that are more and more realistic, such that whenever we test things in simulation, they will be better suited for the real world that we want the robots to be in in the first place. Okay? Um, so I argue that you know, uh, games are great, right? but we can't just be using games. right? We should be able to create environments that look like our everyday uh, lives. Now, in the context of autonomous driving, so how are people trying to create uh, the environment or create uh, some knowledge about you know, how the world looks like? Uh, so they basically try to build maps of the environment. And the typical approach for this is that you have a car with a very expensive sensor on, uh, or set of sensors on top that just drives around the world and is able to capture you know, how it looks like. Now, this is really, really expensive. Every one of these cars is half a million dollars. Okay? And now, in order to collect the world, you have to deploy a fleet of cars that are going to drive everywhere. Right? So you can imagine the type that you need in order to collect the whole world. So we, will, uh, so we look at, well, is there a way to try to collect how the, you know, some notion of how the world looks like without you know, uh, costing uh, much data, uh, sorry, much money? So if you think about this uh, model that, for example, here Maps has, is that you basically have this really narrow view of the environment. Right? You're driving in your car, you only see a few meters in front of you. However, there is you know, so many other perspectives of the world that you could use uh, that are much more broad and you have much more information that basically uh, you, know, you could create a much richer and much, uh, much more coverage uh, model of what the world looks like. Okay, so you can use drones, UAVs, planes, satellites go around the world twice a day, right? So you could have this very up-to-date uh, knowledge of the environment. Okay, so, so recently uh, we spent, you know, I spent half of my team working in the summer on this project where the idea is that I wanted to see and push the community to be able to, um, from uh, images, from imagery, from many different sources, be able to create models of how our world, our cities look like. Okay, so we created this thing called Toronto City. And this is going to narrate for you. We present the Toronto City data set covering the full Greater Toronto area from multiple perspectives. This is an area of over 700 kilometers squared. So this is 20% of the population of Canada, just to give you an idea of how many people are in this area that we cover. With integrated data from many different perspectives. This includes the bird's eye view, ground level panorama, LIDAR, stereo imagery, drone footage, and even airborne LIDAR. It is not feasible to manually label such a large world. Instead, we leverage existing maps of various types for our ground truth. We have highly accurate two-dimensional HD maps, three-dimensional building models, and detailed metadata with full coverage of the city. This rich, multi-perspective model of the world is a perfect environment for a wide range of exciting tasks. So we have a, a whole bunch of tasks for people to participate in order to be able to extract uh, you know, the, the world. Things like instance level segmentation, semantic segmentation, uh, topology of roads. Um, uh, so you see here some of the ground truth for instance segmentation. 
uh, even urban zoning to understand how you know the government actually built the different areas, uh, building height, facade parsing, things like that. So we did a pilot study on how good convolutional nets are these days to solve these tasks, and it's actually striking. Uh, you know, the things that they learn. So you see here some of the latest results on being able to estimate red curves and semantic segmentation. On the right hand side is Grand Truth, sorry, uh, is our estimates. Uh, you can also see here some of the uh, uh, results that we have for instance segmentation, for road, from panoramas, etc. Um, so as I say, this covers 400,000 buildings, 8,500 kilometers of road, uh, 712 square kilometers of data. And we have a whole bunch of uh, initial uh, uh, benchmark tasks, and this will appear. Uh, will be able to, you will be able to download this uh, in hopefully by February uh, or something like that. And uh, there is many, many other tasks that we have. We have every single tree in Toronto label. We have every single pole, every single traffic uh, sign and traffic light, even with the particular 3D shape. Oops. Right and. This, you know, uh, so basically the ground truth that we have provides you with an amazing environment for you to play with uh, to now be able to, you know, do your favorite, uh, uh, um, you know, reinforcement learning and action. Uh, so this is just going to show a video of, you know, some of the Toronto City uh, benchmark. Right, so the idea of the benchmark is that people will develop techniques that will allow us to do this automatically for the whole world. Okay. Um, so you see here some of the quality of the ground truth. We even have, you know, the you know, balconies, windows, etc. Um, and also imagine populating this with many robots, right? And then doing all sort of really cool planning tasks. And as I said, you know, this is for the whole Greater Toronto area. Okay. So just to conclude, uh, so for me, a key ingredients in order to do. Action are actually sensing perception, uh, perception and realistic simulation. And hopefully soon you will hear from me actually talking about action per se. Okay, thank you. We have time for a few questions. Over there. I, uh, I was actually just curious about the, the simulator that you showed. Um, I think we've seen with computer vision and even some of the simulation results that we saw today, that sometimes it's, it's better to have uh, a smaller number of kind of more extreme scenarios that are further out on the edge from what is normal um, than to have a lot of really normal data. So uh, are you guys going to have a plan to add uh, parts to the simulation that aren't necessarily like true to Toronto, but might you know, show more of the variance that you see in these real world driving situations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so one of the things that we are going to be doing is actually cap capturing data as we go. So I want to capture data in the middle of the winter, right? I want to capture data when it's foggy, when, you know, you have uh, torrential rain, right? All these things that happen in Toronto from time to time. Uh, so it's a good uh, platform for testing all this. Uh, but even in the simple scenario, it's far from being solved. Right, so this larger scale will allow us to identify really what are the, uh, the bottlenecks that we have, and then you know we will collect more data there. Uh, now we, the plan is also to start with Toronto, but it's not going to stop in Toronto, right? Uh, the idea is to build this for many different cities, many different places across the world. It's just that it's convenient for me to be in Toronto. Uh. Hi. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the talk um, you were estimating uh, uncertainties. In, mm -hmm. So I was curious if there's a direct mapping between your uncertainty measure and sort of a probabilistic estimate of, of the accuracy, or if it's possible to, to learn those probabilistic estimates um, more direct, directly. I mean, it's learning a probabilistic estimate for every pixel, right? And the loss function uh, thinks, I mean, uh, understands that fact. Oh, now, um, there is, so this is just a first uh, step towards that. Uh, there is many, many things to be done uh, uh, in, in order to create, you know, better uncertain, uh, uncertainty estimates for, uh, you know, all of these different tasks. Now, one of the things that I think are important is to have more holistic models and reasons about many tasks and understanding, you know, how the uncertainty of the different things, you know, affect the rest <coughs> of the problem. Yes. Uh, so that's a very, very, uh, you know, very interesting point, which I think that the computer vision community in particular, even machine learning community, have to pay more attention to. Yeah. 
Let's have one more question. Uh, for your depth estimation work, one of the things that I think is lost when you show the entire image with a single color wheel is the range resolution. Do you have any idea what your range resolution is on those? Uh, that's a good question. So, I mean, the, the results that I saw were smooth with a plain, plain, plain fitting. Uh, the resolution is up to um, around 60 meters or so. Uh, where, you know, but up to 40 meters is pretty decent. Uh, but you can go, actually more than that, because 60 meters is 25 pixels, so you can go, you can go beyond that, but, uh, you know, it's on the limit of, uh, but it's all, all related to uh, your imagery. So this was Kitty, which I collected uh, in 2010, right? So, you know, with new cameras and, for example, the panoramas, you know, you can do much, much better than this, yeah. Uh, one quick question but, uh, while our next speaker sets up. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks for the lovely talk. It's beautiful to see this um, stereo thanks. reconstruction work, but have you seen how it works, how it holds up under bad lighting conditions? Because that's ex exactly where people from the car companies are concerned that these things work, under bad weather, bad lighting, where you have blurred features because of the exposure time and, and shot noise? Yeah, so I'm going to give you an uh, anecdote uh, for this. So when we created Kitty and we put it online in 2012, the first person to complain was a car company, a very well-known researcher, saying that Kitty is too noisy, that you know, there is sense of saturation, that they, you know, what's, what's happening. So, so it's funny that you asked that. Um, so uh, I agree with you. So uh, now we're going to get a car in Toronto, uh, and we are collecting data. And uh, we will be able to you know, uh, get data that is much more challenging in terms of uh, these kind of things. Uh, so it's, it's been so far for me a struggle of not having the right hardware. Right, one of these cars is half a million dollars, why it's not something that I can just buy like this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Let's thank Raquel.